So the first topic today in our weekly update is the World Health Organization. And they have really sort of under the radar, uh, quietly pushed for a lot more power. And um, they have passed a few things. There are the WHO New Pandemic Treaty and the WHO International Health Regulations, sort of binding agreements with member states uh, where they're kind of saying, look, in the next pandemic, which we think will happen, uh, we feel that we should have more influence and uh, you know, we want you to listen better to what we're saying. Now, if you think they did a great job in advising us on the last pandemic, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, I had a lot of concerns about some of the recommendations made. In the retrospect, many things were incorrect and there were a lot of problems. And uh, we turned out to get very coercive measures, which I was really you know, concerned about. But anyway, they, they push for more power. They feel if they have more power, they can do a better job to protect you, Uganda. Now, Again, these two things have passed, and here is, you know, the um, you know, people that are critical of this say, look, this gives them a lot of power. It is sort of binding agreements with member states, and then whatever the WHO says in the next pandemic will go. Now, proponents of all these measures, and, you know, um, people certainly from the pharmaceutical industry, special interest groups, uh, and certain individuals that support the WHO and fund it tremendously, say, no, 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 there's nothing to worry about. In the end, each Member state can still make their own decisions if there's a pandemic. And you know what? They're absolutely right. That is absolutely true. But it's totally missing the point. The WHO does not have to have any direct influence or, or you know, a law that binds us to follow the recommendations. It's not even necessary. Think back to the last pandemic. So we had basically the NIH and the CDC making recommendations that were then put into law by the politicians. And that's how we ended up with mandates and they were very coercive and very strict you know and again these mandates happened uh, because the politicians are saying we listen to the recommendations from the experts from the science and uh, we just listened to them and they told us and so we put it into law because it's their fault now the um, cdc and the nih would say well hang on a second all we did was we made recommendations it's the politicians that put it into law so you see how this is going to go back and forth so you don't have to have you know, kind of a, uh, a rule of law that obliges you to follow these rules, you know. All it is is basically one person pushing the blame on someone else because in the end there might be criticism to some of these measures. And again, the measures during this pandemic were very coercive. Um, I was very much against any mandates. I thought that was very misplaced. And instead of uh, mandating, we should have, have better education and we should have had choice, I believe, okay. And here's one of my biggest criticisms of this whole thing. Um, from the very beginning, you know, there were very um, few interventions that were ultimately offered to people to offer some protection. And a lot of it turned out in the end not to be as uh, great as it was advertised. And it was worse and worse as the pandemic went on. But these promises were made based on listening to the science, you know, and that certainly turned out not to be very correct. Yet we ended up with very coercive mandates and people lost their jobs. People were not allowed to do certain things, travel was restricted, and so on. This was pretty severe, I think. Now, again, if you think this was all great and this should continue as it is and you have you know, no worries that m much of this information turned out not to be quite correct and that maybe some of these adverse reactions now seem to be a lot more prevalent than was initially thought and more and more stuff is actually coming out, Again, if you want to ignore that part and think this is all good and we should go forward in the next pandemic with this, then you're good to go with this. <laughs> but again, I had a lot of concerns here. I had patients come into my clinic, and I'm a simple primary care doctor, patients coming in um, that were refused to be seen by their cardiologists, by their oncologists, you know, by the by the dermatologists. All these are, you know, they said, no, no, you can't, you can't come in without certification. Again, I think this was, as a doctor, quite shameful to turn a patient away, first of all. You know, we have... Uh, we should have known better that in a you know, respiratory virus situation, nothing will protect you 100% from getting infected or spreading infection. That, that from the beginning didn't make a lot of sense. There was never any clear data that showed this. And as, a, as it turned out later on, even the companies producing um, these medications admitted that they never tested for that. Okay? So that was one thing. The efficacy was wildly overstated. And then, of course, you know, as it turned out in the end, um, everybody was in the same boat, no matter which modality they, they followed. But anyway, I thought it was a horrible situation. And it seems that the World Health Organization, though, was pretty much okay with this and they want to push forward because now the newest thing that they're suggesting is the global digital health certification. Sounds amazing. And uh, you'll see a picture here of a 
woman who's on the computer and looking this up and she's excited about it. So obviously something good because it'll protect you, right? Now, what is a global digital health certification in the end? It is going to be a vaccine passport again, of course, for the next pandemic. And again, even if you feel the measures uh, you know, implemented here and the new mRNA technology with all the um, questions it still has and you know all these um, things that are very, very different in terms of technology and our traditional vaccines, but if you're good with that and you think this is all fine, good. However, we don't know what the next pandemic that they really assume will happen, uh, will have in store and what modalities we're going to come up with then. And then if we give power to these agencies, again, they don't have to directly use the law against us. I mean, you know, I mean, what, what are they going to do? What's the WHO going to do if we don't follow the recommendations? You know, have you seen those guys? Um, so anyway, we, but again, the issue will be the politicians, which are heavily influenced by the pharmaceutical industry, will push for implementing these recommendations made by the science, which will then, of course, boost you know the pharma industry as well, because they're the ones selling their product and not just selling it. If it's a coercive measure, you'll be sure they're going to distribute it very well. You know, they're going to have a lot of takers. And um, we don't know what the new thing will be that will be uh, decided on. And I think it's very dangerous to give power to these agencies for that reason. I think that we um, should be more educated. I think we should have, um, you know, better information and also more honest information. It is okay to say, <clears throat> you know, we don't know for sure. We don't know exactly. We believe this is the best strategy. Here's what we offer. Here's what we believe. We believe it will do at this point. And but that was really not the case. It was a very um, arrogant message that we received during the pandemic. It was saying, look, this is the science we know for sure, and anybody else saying anything else is, uh, you know, full of it. That is not how science works, okay? Science is not arrogant, okay? Science is humble. Science is saying, you know, we have to discuss these things, and as we roll out certain measures, there might be data coming back that we then have to evaluate critically. And I think that really that step was missing, and it was not a good way this rolled out. I would suggest it differently. Look, how about, um, and this is something on my main criticism of this, this last pandemic. Again, we only had one measure. We had a new technology. Part of the reason, again, this is just my opinion, why this was rolled out. Of course, they cite that it was faster to produce and we could, you know, quicker adapt. Um, but I think also because uh, monetary-wise, this is a new technology. New technologies come with patents. New technologies come with a much higher price tag. So the profitability was much higher, of course. Now, in my opinion, what we should have done is offer alternatives. And one company actually did, and that was uh, Novavax. Novavax came up with a protein subunit uh, vaccine, which I think was actually very good, and uh, which is similar to a vaccine we've, we've been using for hepatitis B. So we've known this technology. It's not a genetic vaccine. It's not an, an RNA or DNA vaccine. It's a finished protein particle similar to an actual virus that gets injected. You, you, uh, the immune system picks it up, reacts, and so on, and actually works pretty well. However, I followed the whole development. I was excited. I was like, when is this coming out? And a lot of people were observing this, you know. And it seemed to me, at least, again, just my opinion, so um, that they had a lot more hurdles than, let's say, Pfizer, Moderna in bringing the product to market. Um, and again, question is why. Now, I don't have any proof for this, you know, but it seemed to me that the other, the other technologies had a lot less to prove before they made it to market, whereas Novavax had to jump through our hoops. And then the other question I have is, why didn't we do our, what, what China, for example, did with Sinovac? Why didn't we develop a, you know, weakened actual virus vaccine? This is how most of our vaccines work. You know, you take an actual dangerously infectious virus and you let it infect animal cells for a while until it forgets how to infect humans, becomes very good after several generations to infect those animal cells. Now we have a very weakened virus that will not really make us sick but it would still produce similar or the same antibodies when injected into, into our body. And then we use that as a weakened or attenuated virus vaccine, for example. Or you can take the actual virus and you can uh, disable it, you fragment it and use those fragments, and sometimes that works as well. Now, China made that happen. The criticism, of course, is, well, it wasn't quite as effective compared to what? I mean, the data we had come in from you know, our strategies weren't you know, as they were originally advertised either. So I think what we should do going forward is not use coercion and uh, digital health certification, and which will, of course, lead to the same thing again. We, we will restrict travel, for sure. That's one of the ideas of this. 
<clears throat> and also will might lead to again problems in your workplace and in your social life and going to the gym and whatever else. It's gonna that's exactly what this is geared for, I think. But rather say, look, here are choices. Here is a new technology. If you're good with that, go with that. Here is a traditional technology that we offer. Might be a little bit less effective, but that's an option for you, you know. Or here is a testing strategy if you don't want don't want to use either, you know, it's your choice, right? And here are right now what we think of the protective uh, measures or the protective advantages using this, this, or that. That to me would be very fair. It would give people choices and it would really help us, you know, get a shy away from the coercive measures that we've taken from mandates to lockdowns and all these things, which I think in, in, in retrospect were really terrible, right? So this is one thing where I think we should go. And I'm worried about the World Health Organization really. Um, you know, kind of getting into a place where they have, they will have so much influence that uh, it's a bit scary because, again, while they may not be able to force us by law to listen to them, I guarantee you it'll be a similar situation where the politicians will take whatever they say for gospel because it fits their interests and they will pass the laws and that's how it's going to happen. So. One thing we can do as citizens, of course, we can weigh in onto this. Um, we can say, hey, listen, we don't want the WHO to have this much power. Whenever something comes to vote, we should certainly follow it. We should be informed. And um, again, I think uh, the WHO should find their place in um, giving recommendations, which are really in the interest of the broader populations and not just uh, influenced by special interest groups. We have to look at also how these companies are run and how they're funded. I think this is certainly something that will influence the decision making as well, in my opinion. And um, we should probably have other agencies as well that control agencies like the WHO and say, hey, is this really warranted? Are there other, are there other interests? Is this a biased opinion? That's just my opinion on it, but I'm concerned about the WHO gaining so much power. There was a long talk about it, but I think it's important to be aware that this is in the making. And to be honest with you, this you know, uh, global digital health certification thing is something that I don't like.